This is the Truth Be Told podcast, where we unlock the secrets of strategic communication. Welcome to this episode of Truth Be Told. Please make sure to leave us a rating and subscribe to the podcast so you don't miss out on upcoming episodes. Today, I'm joined by CEO and founder of Sales and Presence, Amy Rizak. Through her expertise in sales and executive presence, Amy offers valuable takeaways on how to be more effective communicators. In this episode, we're going to discuss how to perform better at networking events, why you should stop asking the question, how are you, and how to transition from rapport building to more tangible takeaways. Thanks for listening and supporting our podcast. For more information about Amy, visit her at salesandpresence.com. Let's dive into the conversation. The Truth Be Told podcast is made possible by listeners like you and by our loyal partners. This episode is supported by one of our elite sponsors of the International Association of Interviewers, Alto. To learn more about them, visit www.alto.us. Did you know that 60% of retail employees feel only somewhat safe at work? At Alto, we help protect retail staff by acting as the last mile support for in-store incident management. Our nationwide teams of local legal experts and on-site specialists advocate for consequences against those who compromise the safety of retail employees and customers. Alto, a nationwide alliance that protects retailers and empowers communities. Explore the Alto Alliance at www.alto.us. Welcome, everybody, to this episode of Truth Be Told. I'm Dave Thompson, your host. I'm here with Amy Rizak, the founder and CEO of Sales and Presence. Thanks for joining me today. Oh, I'm so happy to be here, Dave. Thanks. Absolutely. I, I love the concept sales and presence. And also on your website, you've got this quote, stop selling to start selling. And I think we're going to dive into that a little bit, but maybe you could just kind of ex explain to our guests how you got into the role you're in founding this company and what brought you here today. Yeah, it was a long haul. I've been in sales, professional B2B sales for 20 plus years. I had a great career, loved it, uh, but really was at a turning point of what do I still do this? and I'm a little bored at what I'm doing or what is my next step? And so I took around six months to really dive into that. And what came out of that was that I really loved B2B selling. I really loved corporate. I liked the camaraderie around sales and what that, that brings and teams and all the things, but I was missing an upskill of a uh, skill set, you would say, on what to do next. In, in my career on how to elevate that and continue to elevate that as a tenured professional in, in sales. And so I took my psychology degree and love of communication just naturally within in humans. And then I got certified in nonverbal communication because that was always an interest of mine. And I took the hard skill set of sales and I merged all three of those to create sales and presence. And the reason that it's named that is because we do sales training and all the things around sales, but we also dive heavily into the communication set as well. So the beautiful thing there is that we work with sales teams, but we also work with just professional development and business leaders and all of those that aren't deemed sales uh, because it aligns with communication. Yeah, I think that's powerful. And that, as, as you know, ties right into kind of the theme of all these episodes is effective communication from unique perspectives. And I was out as when we've been you know talking a few times in preparation for our chat and looking on your website. This this to me connected with all of our our listeners, whether they're investigators or are just professionals in the workplace or people trying to figure out how to communicate with their significant other. But you put you put you put on here by prioritizing building trust, authenticity, and value creation with traditional tactics. Individuals can foster lasting relationships, elevate personal branding, and position themselves as trusted advisors. And so. Maybe can kind of ex explain that what that means, but more importantly for people that are listening, you know, we're not just talking about sales today. We're talking about how these same skills can apply really across across the, the general uh, communication part of life that we're dealing with. Yeah. So it it is. There's those basic tactics if we are in the sales side of things. We all have those. We learn those. But then we can build off of that within the communication. Everyone else who's not in sales also has a direct effect through how you communicate. There's some buzz out there right now around executive presence. And how do you do that? 
um, you know, we've all met someone that just seems to have that it factor. Mm -hmm. And I guarantee they're not born with it. <laughs> they have practiced this. And a lot of that is that executive presence. It's the charisma behind how they are communicating in different forms that are not verbal. And we don't think about that very much. Uh, when we are communicating, the first line that we think of is written word or how we're communicating verbally. And so there's lots more to how we're doing that and how we can upskill success in anything that we're doing, along with communicating with a partner or a friend, which I will say is maybe the harder one just due to emotional things that are behind that. Uh, but we can do that. We can work on that throughout. Yeah. And a lot of what you just mentioned, I know we're going to we're going to break down these topics. So you know, to, to stay tuned for this episode, we're going to get into nonverbal is what I want to talk about first here in just a second, but even, you know, verbal and how we communicate. I've, I've got some um, things that you've written about before, but how simply saying something like, how are you versus hope this finds you well versus, hey, just following up, how those kind of email prompts might change the way people perceive us. Um, maybe how to handle some conflict or resistance and really how do you maintain relationships without annoying the hell out of somebody, right? How do you follow up without being a pain? And I heard we might have another surprise guest pop up on the episode. Emerson oh, is yeah, a mascot. Should we show Emerson? I think we should. I think okay. so people know who's well, listening. Emerson is, yes, he's the mascot of Sales Impressions. This is Emerson. He is a, he is a 14 year old miniature poodle. Uh, he's a rescue and he is always on my lap. So anytime you do virtuals with me, he is the he is the uh, mascot of sales and presence because he is hooked to me. I love time. that. We'll yeah. see if he stays awake yeah. the whole time. I'm also oh, curious no. yeah. from, <laughs> from a communication <laughs> standpoint, when you've got a Zoom call or a, a Teams call or whatever, does that help you build rapport at all? Like what, yeah. what, what does no, it? No, I mean, it's just totally distracts. Of course, right. yeah, it absolutely yeah. does. It absolutely does, right? Everyone... Um, on a rapport level, we can think of that in a human element versus always business and strictly business. I think that virtual, when we shifted to virtual uh, in the COVID environment and really started to do this, we recognized that we could be a little bit more human because everyone was working in our home. So we had kiddos running around or the dog was barking. And at first it was like, oh my gosh. And now it just seems to be part of the conversation, which is great because we're bringing in a different element that wasn't necessarily there before, especially on that front end. And we're all real, we're all human things, things go awry with dogs barking, those types of things, or if you have a little Velcro dog, whatever that may be. Um, and it's, it's fun. It, it brings people in and connects people on a quicker way than what we've seen in the past. Yeah, I agree completely. Who would have thought at some point that everybody would have a designated Zoom, Zoom room in their house or Zoom wall that they're using, but... Yeah. But yeah, it's not yeah. as, as static and sterile in the past as having to enter into a meeting. You know, the amount of times you get on the, these uh, kind of urgent teams or video calls where people are in, a, in their hoodie with a cap on mm -hmm. and they're just, but you see people for just who they are, genuine and, yep. and real. So kind of neat. I know we've got a lot of, a lot of companies that actually do investigative interviews and pre-employment interviews using mm -hmm. video now instead of in person. So same, yeah. similar concept. Same concept. I think we knew it was important especially in the sales room, we heard it before for years and years and years, need to do more video, need to do more video. Uh, if you can't be in person, do video, but no one did it. It was not a thing. I mean, we knew it, we knew the stats behind it. Maybe 2% of people were actually doing it. And then when the whole world had to do it and was required, it really did shift that game. And it was recognizable of how important that actually was. Visual connection is the first connection we have with people that we really can build that trust. And right. so I think it is really important to, to stay on those and stay on camera. You know, there's lots of times where we're on meetings where I see a lot of people off camera. We can still build that rapport internally, externally on camera. Yeah. Now, unpopular opinion, maybe. I wish we had less video once in a while. No, it feels like we can't have regular calls anymore without yeah. having to yeah. be on video. But, well, that goes right back to that old thing of we're having meetings to have to set another meeting. Right. Uh, um, I mean, I think that that's, that's where we are with virtual, too. Um, so I 100% agree with you. If you can take, especially internally, if yeah. you can do the call instead of a virtual, do the call because everyone gets burnt out and they need to be on virtual with, with clients. Right, exactly. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think that brings me, as we're talking about video and, and um, the kind of visual uh, mm -hmm. dynamic of a conversation, this nonverbal behavior piece. Mm -hmm. And it seems like 
every episode that we've had, whether it's been from a, a psychologist or a detective or a journalist, is talking about nonverbal behavior. Um, but kind of this common theme of it's it's so variable. There's no absolute, and we got to get away from that perspective. But maybe you can expand on how do you, how does that impact your space when you're talking about sales and relationship building on the nonverbal behavior? Yeah, it is variable. We have to be careful of that. Everyone has their baseline is what, what we tend to call it, of, of things that they do that are just natural to them. And sometimes if we're looking for nonverbal cues, we can miscue that pretty quickly due to those those baselines because we don't know that person enough. Um, I think in, in my world, what's really important with nonverbal is recognizing our own. So really working on our own to be impactful in how we want to get conversations going or move our success forward. It takes a split second. For someone to subconsciously decide if they're going to like, trust, do business with you, want to have a conversation with you. And in the business world, we don't think of that enough. We think of how we build our agenda, what we're going to write out, what we're going to cover, what we're going to pitch. And that's the typical things that we're going to do, what we're going to cover. Even if we're not in sales, if we are in uh, leadership or anything else within a role, within talking to clients or talking internally, we always have those things listed out. We don't tend to think about how am I showing up to the room? You know, what am I doing to make an impact immediately in the room? And those things come back to, we always feel it. We feel it when someone walks in with, you know, really great posture, maybe their hands are open and welcoming, they're smiling, they're making eye contact, those types of things. We feel like we wanna have a conversation with them and, and really engage. When in other times when someone's walking in and they have this, we all have this hooked to us, Right. And they're and they're talking on their phone or they're doing something and they're not engaging. They're going to maybe get coffee or I call it the the cocktail moment. You know, at networking, we get a little nervous. So we want to run to the bar immediately and then settle in. Um, this is an effect that we do to effectively cut off communication. You know, we're not inviting that in. Every, everybody around us is now not really feeling like, oh, I should go talk to that person. Right. So there are those subtle things that we can do to really open up that conversation and invite those people into our end. Yeah, that's a great take on it because I, I'm thinking of um, every time I'm in an elevator or when I sit on an airplane and somebody sits next to me or I'm sitting at a bar at the hotel by myself and somebody sits next to me, the first thing I'm doing is looking at my phone, sending a clear message, I don't want to talk to you, which sounds yeah. terrible and rude, but that's where I'm at. But you're right, so yeah. if, I, if I'm intentionally doing it there, but then I walk into a business meeting or a networking event or somewhere where I should be social, I'm sending that same message. 100%. And when you're aware of it, then you can control it, similar to how we speak. So I'm with you. If I am traveling all over the place and I'm working with clients at the end of the day, when I am traveling back and I'm on the plane, I really am not in the, the mindset to have a full-on conversation with someone. So I do cut off by looking at the phone or putting you know, my, head, my headset in or whatever that is. To, to somewhat tell people I'm disengaged. We, we do that all the time, not intentionally, but we certainly can once we're aware of it. I'll give you uh, a quick story on this uh, since you brought up Elevator. So two, or a year ago, I, was, I had two keynotes, one in the spring, one in the fall. Um, the first one, so what I do prior to walking out of my hotel room to go down to the, the room to get, give the keynote, is I set up my mindset of how I want to start engaging. Mm -hmm. So keynote here, takeaway is that if you ever go to meetings, your meeting starts well before the meeting. It does not start when you walk in the boardroom. It does not start after you get on camera. It starts when you get out of your car. If you are at a conference, it starts as soon as you walk out of your hotel room because you never know who you're going to run into. And I was walking down the hall and what I prep is my mindset and my nonverbal. So I am open to engagement and conversation. And a uh, a uh, lady walked up and we got on the elevator together. She asked me what floor. I said one. And she's like, yes, I'm going there too because I love coffee. Uh, I am a super fan of coffee. Anyone who knows me. So I'm like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. We're having a great conversation around morning and coffee. And then two seconds later, she took her phone out and started <laughs> typing. On. Conversation was done. Right? Yeah. The interesting thing about that was that this was a 700 plus people conference. She was in that conference because I saw her lanyard. She had no idea I was the keynote that day. They also brought in a ton of clients to be with. So I could have been someone important 
that she probably wanted to engage with, or it could have even been just a really great conversation. We've all had that experience where we run into someone and we're like, gosh, that was such, such an amazing conversation. Completely inspired me. It was unexpected. The reason why? Because you were both open to communication and conversation. So flip that to the fall, same thing happened, walked out of my hotel room. Uh, this time though, I did not know where I was going. It was a very large resort. So I did have my phone in my hand. Here's what I did notice. No one was in the hallway or else I would put it down. I'm trying to figure out where I was going and then got to the elevator, open it up. Gentleman was in the elevator. So I put my phone down immediately, walked into the elevator. We started having small talk. Then I was able to transfer that into my purse. So it was completely away. He had a lanyard on, so I was like, great, I'll just follow him so I know where I'm going. Small talk the whole way to the ballroom. And as soon as we get there, he turns around, shakes my hand, and he's like, I am assuming that you are a keynote today. I'm the president and founder of the company. <laughs> There's your two. That's what, that's what gives you access. Right. right. So that open communication line within your nonverbal communication gives you access to communication and to people you may not have thought about it, that it could. So, so important, right? You never know yeah. who you're interacting you with. Know. You never yeah. know. And that first woman definitely was going to get decaf coffee for sure. Right. Yeah, I can <laughs> right. feel that. Yes. <laughs> I can feel that. Yeah. And I think as you're, as you were explaining that, I've, I've experienced that at the, uh, at a conference where you, you don't know who you're with. They don't know what your role is. But then even um, for a lot of our listeners in the investigative space, I think what's interesting is the ability to develop rapport with everybody and connect with everybody every day. Uh, the amount of information that people are then more comfortable and willing to give you when they say, hey, I just want to let you know I saw some inappropriate behavior by so-and-so or something's going on and I felt comfortable talking to you. That comes from a base of this open, this network that yeah. you're creating. I think that's a great yeah. relation to, to both sides of the, of the fence there. 100%. Yeah, couldn't agree more on that. You, so as we go from kind of nonverbal, and I like that, is more focused on your own. How do you enter a conversation um, or an interaction? But you talk a lot about, I know, some blogs and such on your website, and I recommend people to connect with you on, on LinkedIn as well. A lot of really good content out there. Uh, but I thought this was kind of fun. You, you went through some of the classic or traditional ways that people start an email, whether it's a sales pitch or an email just to a colleague. And I'm reading these thinking, okay, I, I do all of these so I, I can get get better at this. So I didn't really prep you with these. So hopefully you remember what you talked about. Um, yeah, let's see. <laughs> no, I think, these, I think these were great. Um, one of the, the first that you talked about from a, a verbal, when I say verbal, again, this could be written communication is the way I'm, I'm taking that. Um, but something as simple as an email or a cold call, like an outbound call to a client or a colleague or whatever, asking, how are you versus how have you been? Do you remember any, any difference or what the, I mean, it's crazy to me, the numbers you put in here that I have, if we got to go back to them, but what's the difference between those two? Yeah. I don't have the numbers offhand, So you'll have to shout those out for me. Um, go ahead. I'll do it because I think it sets yeah. a good context for you that the, the, what you cited here is that they, this group analyzed over 90,000 outbound cold calls and they found that using how have you been created a 10% success rate in booking follow-up conversations versus one and a half percent with their traditional how are you the difference between how have you been versus how are you how, how does that even make any sense yeah it makes sense because we get used to it so it's the same factor as asking any questions and people automatically their auto response is no uh, that's the exact same thing that's happening here is that when we get so uh, used to something happening or we're expecting something then we don't even respond to it or we respond with our auto response and we're not even thinking. So the goal really, and again, this has to be authentic, you know, so if you're just shouting out, how are you or how have you been um, as a filler, uh, work, to, work to really have that authentic and be genuine of, of really wanting to know how they are. Uh, but taking that into concept of getting them out of element, that's the biggest takeaway here, is that if we can readjust our communication verbally in written or, or communication word and how we're verbally speaking and just micro tweak it. So these are all micro moments in our nonverbal or micro tweaks in our, our verbal communication. We can really change the game because what we're doing is we're getting them out of their element and it's creating impact for response. That's the bottom line. That's what it's doing. That's why that subtle change is so impactful. We are all super busy. We are all inundated with a whole bunch of things today along with everything that is similar 
So when we can make ourselves stand out just by changing verbiage, it's a huge impact. I love that. Be disruptive. I, I think, um, I think that's mm -hmm. perfect. I, and again, I think about whether it's like uh, a sales call, a job interview, a investigative interview, whatever it is, <clears throat> sometimes people are so scripted in those mm -hmm. conversations. And, you know, especially when, you know, every answer is supposed to be no, like somebody's asking you, yeah. like you go to the doctor and they're asking you the 15 questions about right. all these things. No, 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 no. Yeah. You can just change the form of the question a little bit. And it causes this kind of uh, cognitive load, this process of, well, mm -hmm. let me think about that before I respond. Okay. So, I, so I like that. It's a simple takeaway. Next time you send an email or engage with someone, maybe change from uh, how are you to how have you, how have you been? Here's another one. This one I'm guilty of all the time um, is the word just. So you've got an example of, hey, I'm just following up or just wanted to reach out. And I've seen a lot of this lately, a lot on, on mm -hmm. TikTok and Instagram, people talking about it. But what, when I use the word just, what is that implying? It's a filler word. So it's a filler word, but it's also a diminisher word. So if we think about that and you hear the two, so I'm just following up on XYZ or I'm following up on XYZ, uh, it gives you more credibility when you take it out. So we are always looking for two lines of, of balance within how we communicate and connect and grow with a, either mutual client or um, colleague, whatever that is. And one is relationship building. So we, you know, that's to the core. We, we've talked a lot about relationship skills um, in 2024. I know it's, you know, one of the number one things that employers are looking for. Uh, that includes your nonverbal and all of those things. However, you also need credibility. So you can, you can do all the relationship things, but the credibility is a miss, and then you may not ever gain the client because of that, or you may lose a client because of that, um, or the engagement or trust factor along the way. So we want both of those, and that's what that does. So when we're tending to fill a space or uh, possibly have those diminisher words, we want to really recognize those and take those out. If the sentence makes sense without it, take it out. I am still guilty of just today, and I have known this for years and years and years now. The easiest way to do that is write it like you naturally would. Do not send it. Read it through before and take those out. That's the easiest way to do it. That's, that's what I was just going to ask you is um, <laughs> the same. Like how often is – because I feel like this where we, you know, we train on interviewing and communication and here I am hosting a podcast where I'm interviewing and, and I, I violate half of the rules <laughs> we right. talk about, but I think that's important takeaway for people is you have to be aware of it and you have to practice and you need, you need feedback because it's so easy to fall into these kind of natural tendencies. It is. I will take a step further on that. Verbally, there's a big difference uh, verbally. So when we have these filler words of just or um, uh, you know, everyone has heard those. We all have a right is another one that's a filler word that also can end up being a diminisher word. Um, here's the deal on that is that if it's in written word, we, we should take the moment to review it and take it out. When we're having natural conversation like this, it's a thought process that's happening. So when we have those jump in, it's due to actually having in the moment a thought process and that's okay. I don't necessarily need to take them all out or remove all of them. Here's where it gets tricky is if we are doing a meeting, we have a big meeting, or we're a little nervous walking into a networking event, whatever that is, and we start using it consistently. So I'll give you an example. A couple of weeks ago, I was on a training, doing a training for a team, and the person who was uh, introing and getting everything kicked off was very nervous. And you could tell on virtual that they were. And so when they opened it up, um, kept coming up. Um, so what we're going to do today is um, have an hour and um, we're going to do it and just kept coming up. All that is is nerves and non-practice. So if you do have something coming in that's a big event, practice it verbally out, not just in your head, because it always comes out differently and you're like, gosh, where did that come from? So start, you know, practicing that verbally and getting that worked out of the system when you have those things. And then lastly, I'll say, if you're doing a full presentation, if you have a PowerPoint or you're doing a presentation within business, that's where you really need to practice and completely take them out of that. But when you're in a natural conversation, this is, it, it will happen. It's, it's a natural, natural thing when we are in the moment of thinking. Yeah, that's a good delineation because I feel like if you, it's the difference between preparation or not. And yeah. so yeah. if it's natural, I kind of want people to have filler words because it tells me that they didn't come in telling me exactly what they prepared to say, that they're actually thinking about my response and active listening. 
But if they're going to go make a, a presentation or a speech or introduce somebody, have some have some confidence and show that yeah. you actually thought about this before your cup of coffee this morning. Mm -hmm. um, there was a, I don't want to get it wrong, so I'm not going to give too many details, but there was just a, a press conference I watched within the last couple of days or week or so of, uh, I think it was the new UCLA football coach, uh, mm -hmm. them getting into the Big Ten and he's in front of, he's at stage and he's talking about how excited they are to be part of the Big Ten and had nothing to say. I mean, there was no mm -hmm. follow-up. It was a lot of ums and uhs and awkward, you know, five to 10 yeah. seconds it felt like of silence. And so who knows the context? Maybe he wasn't told he's going to have to go do this press conference, but that little snippet, because that's all we get now, these little snippets of conversation, mm -hmm. the credibility looks like, did you even think about this before you walked on stage yeah. today? Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden we have all these thoughts and judgments that could be completely right. wrong because we don't know the entire context, but oh, that's all we get a lot of times. And that's what a lot of people within our organization or our clients or our friends and family sometimes even, that's all they get is, is these snippets of us, you know, walking in. So really preparing that more is is definitely a key to success. Yeah, and I'll, I'm guilty of that. Right here I am. No. Yeah, talking about it, which I don't even know the full story, but that's all I got. And right. And you're right. You think about like that these first impressions of somebody you meet at a networking event or or whatever it might be, and just weren't at their best performance that day, and that's that's what you walk away with, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Uh, I got a couple others that you noted in the same okay. the same article because I think these are really good takeaways for people. Um, you talk about again the same concept of kind of saying you know hope this finds you well, mm -hmm. but personalizing that. And uh, as mm -hmm. as you think about that kind of response, um, you put a number in here that hope this finds you well increases reply rates and increases booked meetings to around twenty four percent. So that's great. And what I'm thinking, what I'm interested in, the amount of times I write like hope you're well or hope your summer is well, I'm like. I, I, of course, I hope everybody's well, but is that a, should I just eliminate that from, from the email? But what you put in here is making it more specific to the person. Yes, 100%. So there's, there's been a lot of buzz around these types of openers and completely taking them out now. There's been a lot of buzz on that. I see it on TikTok uh, a lot. And the thing is, is that just because they don't work the same way they used to doesn't mean we need to completely get rid of them. We need to grow in our communication. They work at a time for a reason. So again, it goes back to consistency and then having it be so consistent and hearing it so much that we are desensitized to it. So we all now all we need to do is change that up a little bit. But we also want to bring in and recognize that we are talking to another human. So, you know, if it's just hope this finds you well, here's what we need or here's what our last conversation was. How does next week look to set up another meeting is very cold, right? But we think about doing that a lot of times in work because it's quote unquote business. We would not send a meeting like that to a friend or someone that is that we are closer to in a personal relationship. There's a fine line there, but I always talk to my clients around bring more of that personality and that personal style into business. It's okay to do that. We're not going to cross the line. But it is okay to do that. So when we're talking to somebody about how are you or how have you been or hope this finds you well, then just adding the name is huge. And there's lots of studies and stats around there that when we say someone's name, it piques interest because it's our name. And we're like, oh, yes, you talk to me, right? That's something that naturally happens. So even putting their name in there, Dave, I hope this finds you well, coming at the end of summer and then moving on, right? That's very personal. And then you're bringing in other elements that are happening. Right. Or everyone is in a heat wave at the moment bringing. So it's a general conversation, but you're recognizing that things are happening with it. Yeah. I was, when you said, um, you know, that's not how you communicate with a friend. I'm think I'm like picturing texting a friend of mine. Hope this finds you well. Is our tea time still on for eight o'clock tomorrow morning? It doesn't make any sense. <laughs> it doesn't make any sense. Isn't that weird? Right. But we do that all the time in business. It's very awkward to me. Right. That we do that. Um, moving that out. That whole that is a that is a what I call the 1990s mindset of, of how we do business. And no one does business like that today. Yeah. But yet we're still stuck in our communication patterns that way. Yeah. Uh, when we talk around, you know, how do you build rapport? Or do you develop relationships? Well, most people in business say yes. Right. And they do that because they're personal and they have those types of skills. But when they get on written word or when they're leaving a message, 
all of a sudden it, we're right back into the 90s and we're completely awkward. So looking to find that, that commonality within that personal space, again, obviously align it to business. We don't need to be 100% personal, but we can definitely shift that up. Yeah, and I've seen it on both sides. I've seen people that are, um, you know, I would say great communicators, lengthy communicators uh, mm -hmm. on the written form. So an email has got four paragraphs and then you go meet them in person and they can't hold a conversation for 15 yeah. seconds. Yeah. yeah. It's tough. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yep. Can um, I say one thing on email? Since yeah. You oh, yeah. Right there, with the, the long form written, uh, we tend to skim. So humans like to skim when we read. Again, think back to all the things you have going on in a day and all the emails that you get and how you go to importance by just skimming and seeing what's going on. Uh, if you are wanting to really communicate well with someone, number one, keep it shorter. We don't want the long form, but two, bullet point it into three bullet points. So we have the power of three. We can't connect more or remember more than three. We get a bit overloaded than that. So do three bullet points so it's easy for somebody to skim it. And if you need to go into the long haul, throw it in a document that you can attach or better yet, get on a call or a virtual or an inbox meeting with that. But that's a really great way to keep engagement instead of book format on email. Yeah, that's great feedback, especially for people that are communicating upwards, right? Mm -hmm. Sometimes sometimes I think, you know, whatever we're working on, whether, again, whether it's sales or whether it's I want to communicate a problem or I need help or whatever it is, mm -hmm. or a recap, it might be the most important thing in your world. But if you're sending it to a leader or somebody else, they might have 50 of those important things they're dealing with. So I think that's that's really good good feedback. And it makes it easy for the receiver of that to then have a checklist. Okay, here's the three bullet points. Let me make sure I follow up on each one of these versus did I miss one sentence in one paragraph of, a, of an essay that was just sent to me? Mm -hmm. that's, yeah, that's I always say make it easy for them. So mm -hmm. everything that you're doing, make it easy for that end user. Whoever they may be, how can you make it easier for them to either read it, conceptualize it, act on, whatever that is, make it easier. You want yeah. to make that easier for them. Yeah. You know what I've really appreciated and I've tried to be better at this myself now, but when somebody sends a follow-up email from a meeting or a conversation or whatever, and it's, it's really making it dummy proof, maybe it's because I've failed before, but it's Dave action items or, you know, yeah. Amy action. And now I know, okay, I've got a lengthy email for context, but here are the things that you need from me specifically it makes it easier for mm -hmm. me to follow follow up. Yep. And you know what they're doing too. So everyone is aware. The awareness is is there and you know exactly where you're going. Which is great. Yeah. The last couple of things in this in the same kind of concept of verbal um, and it relates to what we, we just talked about, but you've got it's an acronym, which too many letters, so I'll just go with the words, but show me you know me, which I mm -hmm. think I think is great. And that kind of combines a little bit with linking the challenge to the solution. Mm -hmm. um, but the show me, you know, me maybe talks a little bit about what we just hit on is how do you kind of relate, but maybe explain a little bit more on how that also relates to the challenge to solution link. Yeah. So show me, you know, me is such a great one. Think of a time that someone came into your inbox or maybe messenger through LinkedIn and started pitching immediately or solutioning immediately, or was talking, it seemed like at you about everything that they could solve for you to make your world amazing yet they had no context of what you do on a day-to-day -day or who you are as a human, and it really pushes it into disinterest immediately. Uh, we've all had that experience. We've had it on you know, somebody calling, some solicitor calling on things. They have no idea who you are or what's happening in your world. We really do value that people take the time to show us that they know us a little bit. We don't have to go deep into things, but we do need to do a little bit of our homework. Um, this may be in a little bit off topic, so I hope I'm not jumping, but there are four pillars of communication. So we think of verbal a lot, we've covered nonverbal, but there's also thinking and listening. The two least practiced are the listening and nonverbal, and the two most important are the listening and nonverbal. Hmm. So what we're wanting to do there is bring in more of those listening tactics to say, how do I, how do I get to know you? The other way you can do that is doing your homework. That's thinking and preparing. That's all that preparing that we should be doing. One of the easiest ways to do that is LinkedIn, right? So we can go on LinkedIn at any point in time and see how long they've been with the company, what their interests are. Maybe they're on boards or maybe they're in a nonprofit. Maybe they like uh, dogs, whatever that is that they, that they really are of interest in. We now have all that information and we can communicate that to say, hey, I've done my homework on you because I value you and your time. 
basically is what we're saying there. Um, and then we can go into some more information that we want to bring. But it's really important to do that first, to, to have them take note that we do value that, that we are encroaching on their time when we're doing anything like a call or an email. I would imagine that relates to somebody applying for a job and reaching out mm -hmm. follow up to a decision maker on LinkedIn. I mean, mm -hmm. that, do some homework first and see yeah. maybe they wrote an article, they're part of a board, like you said, or they spoke at a conference and that can mm -hmm. go so much longer or further than that, you know, 30 other direct messages they're getting that says right. following up on my application. What's the status? Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I will say, um, cause you know, I get messages a lot about whether it's about the podcast or about our training firm or whatever. And sometimes it's, um, so generic where they, they almost are pretending it's probably AI involvement a little bit. Um, but it's, you know, I listen to this and they have clearly no clue what we're actually doing or talking about. Um, but when we connected, you did exactly, you know, your what you're preaching about, right? And maybe you never listened to one. I don't know. But the way you at least communicated to me is you had some context about, podcast and communication and we've got some, you know, uh, kind of crossover overlap here and what we're talking about. It's great. But that may feel, okay, this is somebody's actually listening and we're on the same, th I'm not going to waste time on a call where we're already on different pages. She actually cares. And so I think that's, you're right. Those little changes go a long way in getting a response. Definitely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You had a second part to that. Can you repeat it for me? Um, the part is about link, oh, link challenge to solution that you, yeah. had. you had show me, you know me, and then link challenge to solution. Yeah. So when you do show me, you know me, that's the first part of it. But then we tend to immediately solution after that. So here you are. I know that I did my homework. That's great. And now here's what I can do to make your life. There, there's a disconnect there. We need to link all of that because I don't necessarily know if I care about your solution. Uh, I don't know if I have a problem, right? Mm -hmm. So we are so used to little problems in our day that, that don't get fixed. So things like, um, I'll give you an example of one in our, in our home. So for about a year, we had this weird thing going on with our security system. We could override it easily every night to, to set the alarm. So we didn't worry about it. And I never called them because it would have taken more energy to call and get that all situated. So we just lived with that little bit of pain. So it may be that you're trying to come at me with a solution and I don't really think I have a whole lot of pain because there hasn't been enough impact yet for me to really talk to you about that. So we really need to be coming back to their element of what their challenge is and talking around, do you have a challenge? Do you feel like you have a challenge? What would the impact be of that if you kept going the same way for the next six months? And then, okay, now let's talk about a possible solution. We need to meet them where they are, especially in sales and in business elements. What we tend to do is solution really, really, really fast. And part of that is nerves. Part of that is anxiety. That part of that is not knowing how to communicate to stay in their world long enough. So then we just tend to solution. And this is all back to, you know, that 90s skill set of coming in and saying, here's what we offer. Here's what we have. We're still doing that a lot. So getting out of that practice is challenging but we need to start figuring out where their actual challenge is to even maybe our solution won't matter. We don't even know that we got to sit with them first. Yeah. And I, as you're saying that I'm thinking about in my experience from an investigation standpoint is who's, whose solution are we talking about? Because I think sometimes we have different um, perspectives of what a successful interaction looks like, right? I mean, a salesperson at the end of the day, you can sugarcoat it, but they want the sale and they want the commission mm -hmm. and they want yeah. the, they want the deal, but that might not be what's right for the client at that time. Right. And I think in the investigative space, you know, in their, in the mind, it might be, I want the confession or the admission or these details, but maybe that's not really the solution I should be looking for. Maybe there's more details I need. And to expand on that, what I like what you, the example you gave about the security system, well, they should probably get that checked out if you have a, Oh, we did. Issue. We finally okay. did. All right. That's just my, <laughs> it's my, good. Okay. I was going to say it was still workable. It was still workable. It wasn't, <laughs> we, this is a call out to all the vendors supporting right, the podcast right. that sell security yeah. systems. Fine. Yeah. yeah. Um, right. but no, I'm thinking like sometimes you, you're interviewing somebody it puts you in this kind of space that stole money from a company. We'll just, we'll just say, right. And so from the solution standpoint, from the investigator, they're looking for, I want, I want the money back. I want to know where it is or where it was spent. I probably don't want this employee working for us anymore. Um, some kind of, you know, termination or maybe prosecution, 
But the challenge that that employee might have is not necessarily, you know, confessing or not. Maybe they're dealing with some financial struggles in their life. And the challenge they have is how do I share this embarrassing financial mm -hmm. thing with a stranger? And so the, the challenge and the solution, I think, are are different there. So, yeah, take some empathy maybe to understand where it the does. client is coming from. Yeah. Staying curious in, in their why is really important. And it helps you to not solution so quickly, too. You can stay curious in, in the why of what they're doing. Uh, we'll tend to lessen that solutioning too quickly or even at all. I was on a call this week with a company who really wanted to do some communication training, but then it led a lot more into something that was out of my skill set. And I could have ran with it, mm. right? But that wouldn't have been authentic or honest. And I, you know, at the end I was like, here's here's what I can do. Love the fact that we're talking around the communication skill set and we can bring that in all day long. This I could clunk through enough because I, I do it in my own company, but I'm not the best one for you on that. I can get you some names. Let's let's start there on that one. And then if we have synergy between the two, we can play off of that if that's something interesting. So it's authentic, but it's also bringing value to myself and credibility to me, and it's supporting the client in the way the client needs to be. Yeah, and uh, I just was listening to a podcast. Um, a, a friend of mine works for the Canadian Canadian Retailers Association, at re like real realtors and real estate, and they were talking about sales. And I like this this kind of quote was, "It's okay to lose the transaction, but don't lose the relationship." And that's, I feel like what you're talking about is maybe identifying, Hey, this is not my expertise, or this is maybe this isn't right at this moment, but I would feel like that builds trust for a longer term relationship. 100%. And they're going to, they are going to either use you down the road or they're going to definitely reference you to someone else, right? That right. if you are being authentic and genuine in, in what you can offer instead of, yeah, I can do anything for you and really overshoot that, the, the trust is going to be gone when it's clear that you can't, uh, and the trust is going to be stronger when you are telling them and communicating with them your role in the best way that you can support them. Yeah. And I, so again, I'm going to relate that to some of what I've, I've felt, whether it's again, an investigative interview where maybe somebody felt pressured into complying with someone. Okay, fine. I did this. And maybe that's first of all, a false confession, which is, mm -hmm. could be a problem or maybe it's true, but then the long-term partnership with that employee is probably not gone. But I, I also think about like internal sales, so maybe talking to a boss and saying, hey, I want to raise or I want to have additional headcount, more staffing on my my team. And if you're so focused on that one immediate thing, you could probably pressure or coerce or persuade somebody for that one decision. But if they feel like they were taken advantage of there and they complied with you, do you I mean, how does that impact long term versus, okay. you know, working through it and building trust you know, for, for long term relationship? I think is important. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's a it's a hundred percent a mutual success, no matter you know yeah. who we're talking to and what element it is. It's a hundred percent a mutual success. It is not a you win or I win. It is definitely a where are we going together to create success for everybody? Yeah, <clears throat> which eventually is going to be a win for both, right? Longer yeah. term, right? Yeah. You and it kind of into that space. You talk a lot about um, again on on your LinkedIn and your website, some of the blogs you've you've talked about is preparation before a conversation or a meeting. And I, I'm set the stage for this. You know, when I was reading some of your takeaways here, again, I think it's well outside just, I mean, you keep using the word just is not in my head, but you said it's okay you when I just say it. it. Yeah, say yeah, it's fine. <laughs> yeah. Take it out of all the script. Yeah. But when you're, when you are preparing for a sales meeting makes sense. But I, again, feel like the same thing comes into play for people that are listening that may have to present to a team of leadership to a, a vendor, to maybe they have a case they have to present to law enforcement or a prosecutor to take that case. And I'm going to, you put three categories here. So I think we could maybe break them down through sure. these three, but you talked about, and I'll help remind you of these, we go through them. But the first was exploration meetings. Mm -hmm. uh, the second thing you talked about were, were tangible takeaways. And the third thing you put on here were fresh perspectives. And I, I thought that was a great, just like, Boom, boom, boom. Every conversation I go into, how can I hit or accomplish these three things? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the exploration part, again, goes back to that mutual success and show me, you know me. Right? We're not coming in to talk at, we're coming into solution together. And what do we really want to accomplish in this? So I will put this in my own context. Whenever I'm talking to a client for the first time and they come to me and they say, we want you to do some training for our team. 
or we want you to do a keynote at the workshop. My first meeting with them is let's explore what your goals are for this. What is the intent? Is it just to have someone from the outside come in and talk? Usually not. It's never happened to me. As soon as we start talking about that and exploring it and giving them the opportunity to come in and say, oh my gosh, yeah, can we do this? And this is what we really want to hit on. And this is what we want the team to take away. We want it to be energizing. We want X, Y, Z. Because um, a lot of times we're not offering that enough to give them the space to be heard on that. Um, and it's really important for me. The only way I have success is if they're successful. So it's really important to have that exploration thing up front. Um, and then the second part of that is what are those tangibles? We, we go through meetings so many times. I will give you a scenario of mine. Back in the day when I was going to see clients, a lot of times we would go stop in, say hello, connect. How are things going? It's great. Let's take everybody to happy hour. There's absolutely no tangible there. It is a wasted time. Now, are we building relationships? Absolutely, 100%. Credibility, though? No, not at all. Right. So most people will go to a golf outing or a networking event or go grab drinks. That doesn't mean that they're going to do business with you. That means they just got free drinks. Right. Free things that you <laughs> right. brought in. Right. So we're wanting to make sure that every single time we are planning any sort of interaction, there is a tangible takeaway there. It can be small. It doesn't have to be this ginormous thing. It can be small. It could be one specific question to get to something else but we absolutely need those tangibles in place. And then third, the fresh perspective of things is to really stay curious and have your eyes open to different ways that they are doing things in this fresh perspective or ways that you can bring that to them. So I hear a lot of people or clients that come in and say, okay, here's our data, here's where we are for the quarter, here's how things are going. Well, that's very traditional, right? How can you do that in a fresh perspective? Can you tell stories around that? You know, can you relate that to something else that's going on in the world? Um, give that a fresh perspective so it's a little stickier uh, in those conversations. Yeah, that was great. I want to go. I'm gonna go back to the tangible takeaway piece because, as you were talking about the the golf thing, right, or going out for a reception or whatever, mm -hmm. I've been in these situations plenty, mm -hmm. um, and yeah, and it's awkward because what you're saying is obviously it's right. Is I want to I want to transition that from just we're having a good time and building a relationship, which is a nice way of just like what you said, having a good time and losing golf balls in the woods to how do I have follow up from this? And so the question I want to ask you, and this could be for maybe somebody working in a retail store who has leadership come visit and they're there for 10 minutes and they go to lunch and they don't have much time and they're trying to just be, you know, do their thing or somebody that has the networking event, the reception. How do I go from sitting, having a bourbon, talking to somebody about, you know, the, the last, last night's football game to a tangible takeaway that might be me asking for something. How do I do that without, you know, being awkward? Right. Yeah. And then like so to transition out of this, I need to know. Right. Um, right. <laughs> yeah. Right. Hope you're well. Yeah. Right. I hope you're yeah. well, but yeah. let's get into the meeting. Right. Um, I think so. It takes, it takes some bumps in the road is what I would say on that. It takes practice to, to figure out how to do this, but it also takes that preparation. Because we go into those lunch meetings with maybe the, the leader coming in for the week and we just go to lunch and we've never even thought about what we should be asking or what um, we're curious about or where we want to go with our goals. Maybe that's something that we want to talk about. Right. I've been here for five to seven years. Uh, I would love to just get on your calendar at some point to, to pick your brain about how I can uh, level up and upskill and make sure that I'm doing the company well. That is a tangible, right? We don't have to do the whole thing at lunch. We just ask for the time, right? Mm -hmm. So I think that really preparing that up front is, is a game changer of, of what you want. What is the goal of this? So if we're going to go on a golf outing for four to eight hours, I know golf takes all day long. You know, what is the goal there of, of the tangible for you to, to have a takeaway? Uh, I did this a lot in my sales career, and I lost a client because of this. So we are constantly... Uh, changing and moving and learning and growing on this. And it didn't, it didn't occur to me that this was why until years after when I was starting to do a lot more of this uh, internal work and communication development where I realized, oh, I lean heavy on relationship building. I can do this all day long. I need to really start focusing on 
how I can bring that credibility in and making sure that that tangible is in place every time we go have drinks or every time we're at a networking event. Networking events are tricky because we get a little bit nervous sometimes when we walk into a huge room of people. So what we tend to do, this is what I call with situational questions too, is we tend to get grounded by running to the bar and getting a drink. So we, you know, our communication then is cut off as we talked about earlier because we're head is down and maybe we're like pretend texting to someone, right. or we're, you know, pretend talking on the phone. Where are you at? I don't know. So we feel like we are doing something um, to make ourselves settle down. And then we go have a drink and then we're like, okay, now, now I can talk. Well, all that 10 minutes that you just did that is a complete myth of open communication. So to really pull that all the way back prior to you ever walking into a large room of people to say, how am I going to show up? Maybe that is my tangible today that I'm practicing on is to put the phone away and to feel really awkward and uncomfortable in the space. And then maybe saying, okay, I want to go introduce myself and talk to at least two people I do not know. Because the other thing we do is we tend to, it's like the junior high dance where we go just hang out with the friends that we know. Right. right. So getting out of that element too. Those are tangible takeaways because you're not only tangible doesn't necessarily mean for the person that you're, you're talking to. Although a lot of times it does, it also means for you, you're constantly growing and changing and upskilling. And we're talking about communication. That's something that we have to practice constantly. So maybe that's the tangible for you in some situations. Like that. Yeah. That's really good because I, when you said junior high dance and I was thinking about <laughs> piecing everything together, I'm thinking like you're, you're trying at a networking event and this, this is the relation, but you're not, you're trying just to get a second date. You're not trying to propose. Mm -hmm. Right. You're, and yeah. I think, cause, cause you never want that perspective. And I know these people where it's like, all right, I want to avoid this guy or this woman because every time she talks to me, she's trying to sell me something. Mm -hmm. But instead if, and I like that it's kind of walking in, I'm going to this lunch meeting or going to meeting with three leaders in my company. My goal is, is can I simply get them to commit to a follow-up meeting in two weeks? Or can I get yeah. this one thing out? I think that's a, a good micro step to the next to the next process. That's really, really good takeaway. Um, yeah. The last kind of area before we, we wrap up, and it, I, it, I think it's a culmination of everything that you've talked about so far, is really just relationship building. So we're talking about kind of the that introduction and how do I – uh, overcome some of these barriers and discomfort, my nonverbal, my verbal, and you said talk about thinking and listening, um, but long-term communication. And I've got some these numbers that you put up, which I thought was really interesting. You just posted this recently. Um, yeah. I thought this was really neat. 80, well, neat or scary. 80% of sales need five follow-up calls. 44% yeah. of salespeople quit after one. And and again, if I, if I translate that and what I'm interested in your perspective, whether it's like I apply to a job and, you know, how, how much can I follow up without annoying the hell out of the recruiter or the hiring manager, or, um, you know, I'm interested in working with a new partner or new, whatever, it's something you need follow up as the numbers show, but it can also be annoying. So how do you manage that kind of free? And you put it in three categories. You said frequency, strategy, and value. How, how do you balance that without being the person that ends up in the spam filter in the email? Uh, you prepare it. So you need to prepare a cadence prior to. You need to think about the long game instead of just the right now. And you also need to take it out of context of what you want. So again, that goes back to, you know, what is my purpose of doing this versus that person uh, is not 24 seven thinking about me. <laughs> right. um, but I'm thinking about them if I'm looking for a job, right? So how do I impactfully do that? The, the number is actually even higher. So if we think that 80% with five follow-ups, that's if we've had engagement mm. already. So if we've had one meeting or we've met at a networking event or we've had an interview, that's one. We still have those five or so more to go. If it is brand new, so if we're talking like in a sales element and we are cold calling, let's say, it is well into the eight to 15. Touch. So here's where it gets tricky is that, let's go back to this 80% and five follow-ups, is that if we do our one, which is, let's say, uh, the interview, okay? And then two is an easy one because we're going to send them a thank you. Right. Traditionally, thank you, email, follow up. Thank you for your time. You know, all those things. And then where it gets hard is number three. That's when it starts getting difficult to say, what am I saying? What am I doing? And that's where your thinking really comes in and preparing of show me, you know, me of back to who are these people? What are some elements that I can bring out of that conversation and bring back in? So another thing that I love to do is go back to my notes in whatever meeting or interview, or if it's a, you know, for a job, whatever that is, 
and say, okay, what did we talk about here? How did they talk about it? That's really important. So we're going to use their language in this moment, and then I'm going to recap it for them to give them a reminder of, of what we talked about. So if you think about it, they are interviewing, if we're in this context, they're interviewing how many people? So we need to show them that we remember what we talked about and give them a reminder of that. And that goes back to, you know, you can bullet that really easily in an email of these things. Thinking about our conversation time together, remembering that we talked about and the importance of, right? So we can fill those things in, but really bringing that context back instead of checking in to see if you have a time frame on when you maybe decide. Have you forgot about me, basically? Right. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's yeah. good. Like you said, so sending maybe an article of, hey, you mentioned you were interested in this, or I just read this book, or here's the podcast I was talking to you about, or whatever, mm -hmm. yep. goes a long way. Yeah, yeah I like yeah. that. Yeah, bringing but, that value in and thinking about it more so in the framework of, again, that mutual partnership and not just this is what I want. Right. Yeah. Here's I read, here's the book we were talking about. Mm -hmm. Here's what you think. And then it gives you an excuse mm -hmm. for the next follow up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And I would even, I would expand that to one more and say, you know, chapter five, uh, section, whatever, page 250, this is what I was thinking about specifically with our conversation. That really shows them, that, oh my gosh, they really took the time to be like, yes, this is relevant. This is why. Yeah. So the why is really important of things. Uh, I think that is part of the reason why this company and what I do has been successful. When I think back to my role and what I did and all the things that were brought in to support and help me. Those things were great, but those are also baseline. So that's your product, your service, your company is baseline. And then you learn those hard skill sets of sales, that's your baseline. So then there was like a what else? And a lot of times you'd bring in uh, a trainer or the VP would be training on something and it in inevitably fall into product training. So not communication or skill set training. And then, or if we'd had a keynote at a conference, it would energize, it would be amazing, but then the why or the how behind it drop. Yep. And I think it's just really vital to check in with yourself every step of the way, say, why am I doing this? How am I doing this? And that will help you within your communication. Cause a lot of times you'll call yourself on it, out on it. Oh, well, I'm doing it because I want this response. Well, then how can we do this to make it yeah. And when you said that, I'm thinking about, you know, even how, how we can be better, but I'm thinking when we present at a conference or whatever, and uh, we'll send a follow up to all the attendees, hope you enjoyed. And here's what we talked about. But if we can pull out that one or two things that clearly hit with the attendees, right? We know you're dealing with these issues as a reminder. Here are some of the learning points that mm -hmm. I think it re-energizes that conversation and keeps it more sustainable um, yeah. than it did yeah. in the past. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. So for example, on anything that I train on or talk about, there's always nuggets that come to me. People will always ask questions or make a comment on something. I have an entire suite of PDFs on every single one of those nuggets. So then I can follow up with, here's what your team brought to the attention. Here's the way that you can support that and how that they can actually do that in an actionable step. Right. right. We want to make sure that we're bringing that value well beyond the one time that we're talking to them. And that's a win-win because the, you know, the client gets knowledge and resources and then you get further engagement and trust. Mm -hmm. So that's, yeah. that's great. Yeah. Before we wrap up and I, I have kind of one final question for you, I just yeah. want to make sure people know how to, how to connect with you um, and that you offer a whole bunch of different services. So I know we only, we got an hour that flew by, but you got mm -hmm. so much content clearly that you can speak to a lot. We didn't, yeah. even, we didn't even touch on today. Yeah. So I know salesandpresence.com, I know connect with you on LinkedIn, but yeah. feel free a little bit more about kind of what services you offer and, and how people can connect with you uh, uh, easiest. Yeah. So either way, uh, on my website, there will be a little pop-up that you can put in there and I can reach out to you. My email is amy at salesandpresence.com or connect with me on LinkedIn and message me there is the easiest way to do that as well. Our offerings are really uh, around the communication umbrella. So the number one is the communication umbrella and how that falls then is it within the sales space. So a lot of sales teams where we can come in and do, we can do the hard skill set training as well, but then we do that advanced skill set of how are we communicating? How are we tweaking those words to really make that impact and that success? Uh, relationship skills, executive presence, all of those things are really the number one. Those power skills or soft skills that we talk about a lot are the number one thing that we should be focusing on today. And that's, that's what we do. 
On the flip side of that, we have businesses that need that professional development and that executive presence, and they're not in a sales role. We do that as well, again, because relationship skills and all of those power skills really matter. So we're going in and working with teams there. The difference between us and some other companies that's of value is that we're boutique, which means that we work with you within your element to become an extension of you, not just coming in and saying, here's what we provide. We're really going to work within your element to be in your world and your team's world to develop those programs with you to make that biggest impact. So that's the umbrella of, of really what we do. And we do that with trainings and keynotes and coaching. Yeah, that's great. And I recommend... Um, as I mentioned a few times, but connecting with you on LinkedIn, there's a lot of great resources as you referenced. Um, we'll put the website and your contact info in the show notes. So if people are, are listening while driving, do not write this down. We got it. We got it saved for you. Is there an extra fee to get Emerson to present at a keynote or no, he... I know, right? Um, yeah. yeah. I mean, if you want the dog to travel, he does travel. Yeah. Um, <laughs> he's do we like, wake him up? Yeah. Yes. Oh, yes. He sleeps 24 yeah. seven. Well, I'll let, I'll let you, um, Kev, cause we end every episode with kind of one last, one last truth or one last takeaway for uh, people that are listening from your perspective. Yeah. I think that, um, the biggest takeaway is that how you communicate is a direct reflection of your success. So how you communicate in all those spaces. And again, communication is four lines. So you're thinking, you're listening, you're speaking and you're nonverbal. How you are communicating is a direct effect of your success. So if we can continue to tweak that and analyze that and have those micro moments, you will have the success that you're looking for. Perfect. And I, I think there's plenty of takeaways you gave in the last hour or so to help people help, you know, at least start perfecting those skills or at a minimum, think differently about it. Um, yeah. Be disruptive, I, I think, is one of the first <laughs> things that we said. And I, I think that's mm -hmm. a perfect, perfect takeaway. Well, thank you for your time today. I appreciate it. You're welcome. I was honored the, to be here. The guest appearance of yes. the puppy. <laughs> um, but thank you. And we'll make sure to include the notes in the show notes so you can follow up with Amy. I recommend doing so. And thank you all for listening to this episode of Truth Be Told. Please make sure to like, share, and subscribe. And to keep this conversation going, follow the Truth Be Told podcast on LinkedIn and Truth Be Told CFI on Twitter. On behalf of the International Association of Interviewers, Rick Landers Zalowski and our valued sponsors, thank you for joining us on this episode of the Truth Be Told Podcast.